Mark chapter number 8, verse 22, it says this, they came to Bethsaida, and some brought, some people brought a blind man, and they begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, I don't know why he did that. Nobody knows. I've read a bunch of stuff that doesn't line up. We, we don't know why he did it. He just spit on the guy's eyes. He can do whatever he wants. If you're going to heal me and you're going to spit on me, cool, that's fine. Um, he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus then asked him a question. Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Now, Father, we ask that you'll pray and add a blessing to this word that it would come to life in a way that we never anticipated or imagined. You would speak to us in ways that would shift us to the future. In Jesus' name. I, I want to begin by dealing with a new series. And I may go back and conclude this joy and pain because there's a level of joy that we need to talk about that's important. But I do believe that joy is different from happiness. They, they're two different type of things. Joy is the ability to still feel good even though things around you are not good. But joy throughout scripture is told, Frank, is told that joy comes from God and that God fills his people with joy. So if you may be low on joy this morning, maybe you should ask for a refill. But I, I wanted to shift our, our series a little bit um, to this traditional way that we've been doing for many years is that in May we, we always seem to land on prayer. It's always just been something that we do. But I, I really want to talk about it because I, I think that we, we as a church in, in church collectively we tell people you need to pray. And, and then I'm coming to realize that maybe we're not doing a good job of teaching people how to. So we're, we're forcing down their throat, you need to pray, and they're like, okay, great, you just gave me a gun, but didn't teach me how to use it. So when someone breaks in and I really need to use it, I don't know what to do with it because you just told me I need to do it, but you didn't tell me how to use it. One of the most underused weaponry in the arsenal of the believer is prayer. Prayer is a mysterious tool. Because even the disciples were inquisitive in Matthew 6, desiring to learn how to use this tool while watching Jesus use it. Jesus really made it easy by highlighting a model-like prayer. How many of you have ever been to a model home? You walk in this model home, it got all of these things in it, and they're trying to show you what your house could look like if you just do what the model did. Now, the reality most of us know is when we get our house, it looks nothing like the model house. They, they did all these upgrades to it. And what Jesus is doing is he's giving us a model prayer saying, this is how I pray, but you can add this to the room. You can add this to the master. You can add this to the second bedroom. You have free reign to do whatever you want to do. I, I'm just telling you how I do it. And it's the model. And Jesus really made it easy by highlighting this model prayer. But prayer is humanity's, if you're old school, prayer is humanity's pager. How many of you had a pager growing up? Oh, yeah. 
or if we're moving a little bit further, it's, 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 it's the fax machine. How many of you had a fax machine? Boy, you go real, real old school, right? You got fax. How many you had a, it, it's the rotary phone. How many of you had a rotary phone? Y'all remember that rotary phone? You had to circle it around and circle it around. And, and if you messed up, you had to hit the click button and then circle it around. All the babies after 2000, like, what in the world is he talking about? Or, or it was the telephone that you would have. Or it was the email. Or the text. Or the cellular call to the divine. It was humanity's way of being able to call the divine at any time. This series is actually labeled not prayer, it's labeled Wi-Fi. It's a great analogy to prayer. Wi-Fi is a signal or a portal which connects you to the world wide web. Prayer is a signal that connects you to the divine. This morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching this, I want to expose at least my hermeneutic on Mark 8, 23 through 25, that prayer will have you see what you can't see. Or as I've labeled this sermon this morning, I see men as trees. I want to talk about that. I see men as trees. Mark 8 is not a passage of particular prayer, but it is a passage of a man of prayer who uses his prayer life to deliver somebody who's blind. And I, I believe that many of us are blind in areas. How many can agree that there are some areas I'm just blind in? I don't, I don't see. I, don't, I just don't know. I, I'm trying to see, but I, I just don't know. I, 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 I have some thoughts, but, but there are areas I'm really struggling in. Um, I'm blind in. You, you know, you ever drive and you have a blind spot and you're driving and you're doing the best you can on the road and you turn and then somebody honks you and you're like, man, I didn't even see that car. It was a blind spot. Well, what I believe prayer is, is the little blinker that we got on our cars that lets us know that there is a car on the side and if you tend to go, that little dot will light up and let you know, even though you don't see it, it's still there. And here it is, this man is blind. Clearly, he's blind. And they bring him to Jesus, which is what we should bring to God, is the things that we cannot see, we should bring them to God. I can't see through my job, I should bring it to God. I can't see through my marriage, I should bring it to God. I, I should bring my finances to God. My finances is blind. It's so blind, I'm in line at the Gucci store at Millennium Mall, standing in a big line to buy some shoes that are $800, and I don't even have a savings account. My money's blind. It's the things that we should bring to Jesus when I'm standing in line at the Louis Vuitton store and I'm about to spend a thousand dollars on a purse and don't even have six months worth of reserve in my account. I need to bring those things to Jesus because it's blind. It's, it's the constant going back into relationships that are not healthy, but you still keep going. I need to bring it to Jesus because I'm blind. It's, it's the idea of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. I need to bring it to Jesus because I'm blind. It's the behavior patterns that sabotage what you want to do, and you need to bring it to Jesus because you're blind. I, I believe that there are many of us in this room that want to pray, but we struggle to pray because prayer is a hard thing to stay focused and do. And this man is brought to Jesus because he's blind. And then Jesus does something that I think is interesting. He, he spits on him. Now, theologically, I don't know why he spits on him. Nobody does. Jesus is Jesus, so he can do some things that don't make sense but are fun to him. Can you imagine, though, just painting this picture of you being blind? That means your hearing is much better when you're blind. And you, you go to this man who everybody told you can heal you, 
and you hear this guy you, you come on people let's let's be honest with ourselves you, you, you went to this man of God who you've been hearing about, go to Jesus, he, Charles, he's going to hook you up, he's going to take, and then he starts to spit, and you start thinking to yourself, I'm blind, but this show sure enough sounds like this man has spit on me. And I don't know if he spit in his hands or spit in his eyes, but, but you can tell that I felt something wet touch me and it ain't raining outside. Can I ask you a puzzling question? Are you willing to let Jesus embarrass you to promote you? That God can use unconventional things to bring you what you really need. That, that God can use things that you never thought could be in together and he can make them work together like, like sugar on grits. He can make things that don't normally go. He can make them work together. And God has a way of bringing two anomalies and making them work together. But he uses this man as a conduit. And here is what I need to tell you because this point number one because you missed it he takes the blind man out of the city why would you take a blind man out of the city perhaps because Jesus did not want this man to go and tell everybody what he did and then they impede his messianic ministry but 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 on another level he may have taken this man out of the city because prayer requires an atmosphere. And some of us struggle to pray because we don't have the right atmosphere. And if you create the right atmosphere, you can have instant connection with the divine. This is why Jesus, whenever he went to go pray, he didn't just go pray where he was comfortable. He would leave where he was comfortable and he would go to the upper room and he would go up to the mountains and go pray because Jesus knew that in order for me to have a successful prayer life, it requires the right atmosphere. I just can't pray anywhere. And even Jesus said, you know what? I want to do a miracle, but I can't do it here because this atmosphere isn't right. If you want to start in engaging God more effectively, you need to create the right atmosphere. You just can't go to God and go pray to, you can, I mean, you can pray to God anywhere. You could be on the middle of a plane and a plane's about to drop out the sky. You ain't got time to set an atmosphere at that time. If you're about to get into a car accident, you ain't got time to set an atmosphere. But if you're just doing your day-to-day -day prayer mode, maybe it might be helpful if you got up and you said, this is a particular place that me and God are going to meet. It is a daily place. It is a reoccurring place. And I'm going to have some worship music playing or some praise music playing because God needs an atmosphere and my faith needs an atmosphere too. So prayer requires an atmosphere. But I, I do want to tell you that prayer is not the, it is and it is not. It is the ability to persuade God, but it's also not a tool used to persuade God. See, people get disappointed in prayer because they think it is a legal defense that they can use when things don't go their way. So, so prayer doesn't work because I asked God to do something and he didn't do it, therefore this doesn't work. Well, prayer is not to be a tool to get God to change his mind all the time. Prayer sometimes is a tool to help us understand what we cannot understand. Prayer sometimes is a tool to get us, and some of us are praying about circumstances that God told us is dead. God is like, I'm not reviving that, leave it, but you keep on staying in it, thinking that you're going to change God's mind. And God's like, if you keep on praying, all you're going to do is learn how to exercise your mouth. Because I've made up in my mind, I'm not changing it, and you talking to me is not going to persuade me to do something different. And I have had many times where I thought God told me something, and I thought it was God, and I prayed about it, and I asked 
asked God more for it, and I prayed more about it, and God still didn't respond the way that I wanted him to respond. I've learned something that is pretty powerful is that some Sometimes God will tell you no. And no is not a bad thing. Sometimes no is a helpful thing. Sometimes God will tell you not no. Sometimes God will tell you yes. That's the part where we shout about. We dance about. God did it. He made it happen. He made a way out of no way. He is the God of a ah, man. He is my God. I love him. I can trust him. I can count on him. I can depend upon him. And then there are times where he doesn't say no. There are times where he doesn't say yes. There are times where he says grow. That you're praying for something that you haven't grown up for. Now let me help you get God's attention. Because there's nothing like people who know how to pray. And let me just highlight to you that many of our mamas and daddies uh, and, and grandmamas, they, they, they're going on to glory. And, and they're, they're going and leaving the earth. And their, their prayer mantles are, are being taken. And they're dropping them in the earth. And they need somebody to pick them up. I mean, who going to pray for your babies if grandma ain't doing it? Who going to pray for you like mama prayed for you? You know how mama would stay up and pray for you all night. You were clubbing and mama still prayed for you. You were drinking and mama still prayed. You were doing your thing and mama still prayed for you. you you're doing whatever and mama has this visions and all these type of things. But it, you and I need to learn how to create atmospheres. And here's the number one thing that hurts people. When Jesus prayed, you never see it in scripture. When Jesus prayed, him praying in his mind. He always prayed by opening his mouth. And many of us don't pray well because we try to pray in our mind. That don't do well because when you pray in your mind, you start thinking about LeBron playing and coming back. You start thinking about all the other things. You start thinking about Wharton not bringing me my birthday gift. You start thinking about all these extra things that have nothing to do with prayer. And this is why it's so critically important that you learn how to use your mouth because your mouth is a weapon. It is an arsenal tool. And I want to teach you how to pray because I don't want to just tell you to pray because there are seasons where I don't pray. I'm just going to be honest with you and prayer sometimes is a season where God will invite you into a deeper space with him and usually when I'm not praying my mom will call me and say baby I had a dream oh Lord what was your dream? I just saw you weren't praying and thought, okay I'll get back to it mama and, and this is why because you get off of your regimen and you get off of your routine and this is why it is important that you could even start your day driving in your car instead of listening to, to the formerly Tom Joy in the morning show, now it's the other guy, and you can start turning the radio down and say, you know what, I'm going to use my drive time to pray. I know you're at home because COVID, but you could use those opportunities to use them as prayer times. And how do you begin your prayer time? How do you, especially men, men have a hard time praying, and it's not really that hard because we're waiting on a response, and we feel like when we're not hearing a response, that means that the prayer is not valid. Sometimes God hears us, he just doesn't respond respond right away. Sometimes he's thinking about what you said. Sometimes he's setting up what you said. It's so important for you to utilize the vocality of your words. It is important for you to tell God, listen, it doesn't need to be like Jesus prayer. It just needs to be like the model house. It needs to have four bedrooms. It needs to have a bathroom. And Jesus says, as long as it's got a bathroom, as long as it's got a house, as long as it's got a roof, as long as it's got a foundation, it's a house. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray in this manner. You need to say our father which art in heaven it's all about adoring God let him know who he is in your life because that matters I need to know am I your source or is your job your source and you may be like man God has already known that he's heard that now nah, baby ain't nothing like you hearing it again and again I know you told me you loved me yesterday but tell me it again I know you said that was a good sermon but tell me it again because I need to hear it because I forget and sometimes life will get overwhelming and you need to be reminded of and so you need to go to God and just say, God, I'm just tired. I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to do. But my pastor said that God wants to hear from me. Even if I have nothing to say to you, I'm going to let you know that I'm still here. I've got something to say because prayer is a conversation. It's not just a tool of persuasion. And he takes him outside and he begins to pray for this man. And I would like to say that Jesus takes him outside as a one-on-one -on -one because it's personal. 
it's personal. I don't, I've learned over my life, I don't judge who goes to heaven or hell because salvation is personal. In the French words, David P. in Canada, they said, Mosali est personnel, which means my salvation is personal. It's, it's not something you can judge anybody on, but Jesus wanted to show them that it's, it's personal. This healing is personal. I, I need you to be close to me for me to do this for you because this is not just a random miracle. All miracles have been recorded except for three being recorded that it was personal. This one was personal because prayer is personal. No one can pray for you like you. It's personal. I know you're going to come and say, Pastor, pray for my baby. He's sick. But you know what? The pastor's going to pray for him, but no one's going to pray for your baby like you can. I, I, I appreciate, I do need intercessors. We need them with all of our heart, with all of our soul. We need people praying for us. We need mamas praying for us. We need daddies praying for us. But if you don't pray for yourself, you're in a real bad place because here's the reality. Nobody's going to pray for you like they are supposed to. I hate when somebody is sick online or when someone has died and someone says, oh, I'm praying for you. I'll be like, that is the worst prayer in the world because you commented you praying for me. How long did you really pray? How much time did you spend vested in prayer? Or did you just put an emoji up there that symbolizes your prayer? I need somebody that's going to take the time and pray with precision. Here's the next one. It's not only personal, it's got to be precise. Sometimes you need to write down what you want to pray about because you're all over the place. You done prayed for Africa, you done prayed for China, then you came back for the virus, then you came back for some other stuff. God's like, I'm all over the place. I don't know if I'm supposed to touch this or touch that. Sometimes you need to be directed because your thoughts are everywhere. And you may go in there and say, I'm going to pray for three things, but do not go praying to God and skip telling him who he is. That's the biggest part you need. You need him in that room. You need God. I can bring God in a room. There's many things that I cannot do, but one thing I can do is bring God in a room. I've done, I'm not good at a lot of things, but one thing I know for sure is I know how to bring God in a room. It's not a secret formula that's only for the pastor. It's for everybody. It's just simple. It's your personal relationship with God because it's personal. It's just saying like, God, I know that without you, I am absolutely nothing. Thing. I know that you are the keeper of my mind. I know you're the keeper of my soul. Without you, I cannot do anything. You are my resource. You are my source. You give me joy. You give me strength. You give me peace. You give me comfort. When the world walks away and all the lights are off, you will be right there with me. If I make my bed in hell, you will be standing right beside me. If I don't have you, I've lost everything. Take my money. Take my car. Take my house. But if you don't take your spirit from me, I can get it all. But you see how quickly you felt that? That's not because PDSJ prayed. That's because God's ear is longing for the lover that will tell him who he is. And when I started praying, the angels had to stop because God was like, I, I don't need to hear you. I got somebody in the earth who's talking to me and I need to hear them. And you know what's funny? God didn't come down and say, David, I heard you. God didn't come down and say, high five, I receive your prayer but I've got to have the confidence to know that whenever I open up my mouth, he has already heard me. He has already began to make a way where there seems to be no way. I need you to know that God hears you. And even if it doesn't go the way you want, you need to know that God still hears you. Even if it's not moving at the speed that you'd like it to move, God hears you, but he needs to hear from you. But then... he goes out and then he prays for him and some would say that the, the, the healing was progressive that he first says I see men as trees and then Jesus prays for him again and then he says I, I see men clearly. But most scholars agree with that. I, I would like to argue against what scholars think. I would like to suppose maybe, I can't prove it, but maybe Maybe he started to see like the divine sees. And then maybe when his eyes got open, he started to see supernaturally. And when he said to Jesus, I see men as trees, God, oh, wait, 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 I, I, I meant to heal you, but, or maybe Jesus was giving him an opportunity to see like he sees. 
See, what we need to pray is like, the reason why I said I want to pray like men seeing trees because some of you got to be able to see beyond what you see. I see men, but I see men moving as trees. I see a smile, but I see beyond the smile. I see the hug, but I see beyond the hug. I see the eyes, but I see beyond the eyes. And you and I need to learn how to pray that we see beyond what we see. That's what you call being able to have supernatural insight. I want to see how God sees. You know how joy comes when you don't see it like you see it. You see it how God Jesus. I want to be able to see clearly and not be able to be in the fog. I don't want to live my life in, in the fog. I don't want to live my life not knowing. I don't want to live my life in the fog. I don't want to live my life unclear. And maybe my prayer needs to be, God, give me clarity because what this guy experienced was clarity. He was able to see clearly. And there is no way that you can encounter Jesus and not see clearly. There is no way you can encounter God. There may be seasons where it's foggy. There may be seasons where it doesn't make sense but if you go to God God will begin to clarify what you did not see and maybe in this season it's not a job issue it's a clarity issue maybe it's not a money issue it's a clarity issue maybe it's not a relationship issue it's a clarity issue maybe it's not a communication issue it's a clarity issue and maybe you and I should be praying God let me see clearly what I'm not seeing let me understand what I'm not understanding because there's a lot of frustration that is coming because we are not seeing as he sees. We are not hearing as he hears. And when people bring you things before you respond, maybe you should say, let me go pray about it and see what God is saying. Because you may miss a God moment because you're seeing it with natural eyes. I cannot afford to see things with natural eyes. You are making big decisions and you can't afford to have an oops. You can't afford to say, my bad. You can't afford to say I missed it you need to be able to see what others cannot see and before you make that yes before you sign that signature maybe you need to close the door and say God I need you to give me the ability to see men as trees so that I can see supernaturally so that I can have discernment that goes beyond your age beyond your education beyond your finances you and I need to be able to see what it is for what it is and if you miss it you're going to miss it all and you and I got to have the ability to pray and see clearly I see men as trees the Greek word dilepo which is the word to see through are you really sick or are you oppressed you can't determine you can't see is your child having nightmares from what they watched or they're having nightmares because they're being attacked. You got to be able to see. Can't call your pastor to see that. Can't call the intercessor to see that. What if you call, they don't answer. What if you call, they got Metro PCS and it ain't working. Hello, hello, hello. And then you're sitting there stuck trying to figure out what to do. Let me tell you something. That is where you need to be clear. Sometimes we're going to pray about things where we just need to say, God, just give me instruction. Give me clarity. I want to make sure I'm clear on this. I want to make sure I understand what you're doing. And some of you can't hear God because you're offended. An offended heart has a hard time hearing God. Let me hurry this to a close. Prayer restores because he couldn't see. But now he can see. But now he can see. When I was thinking about this, I think this is one of the most valiant points. And this is where Christians miss it. Give me some. This part is probably the most important part of the message. And it's probably the part that you should really consider. All the other stuff is important, but this to me is extremely important. What happens, Pastor? I prayed. I sincerely asked. And God said no. I, I need to be honest with you at first. Because there are some prayers that are not going to be answered in your favor. Then why pray? No, 
it's just, it's just what it is. Pastor, can you come pray for my grandma? She's 165. I want you to pray that God would keep her strong and keep her alive. Grandma's on a ventilator. Lord, keep her in Jesus' name. And grandma's praying in her heart, Lord, let them let me go. And then she dies and I'm mad at God. You know, I, I find every sermon that there are conclusions of my sermon in my day-to-day -day life. And this, this one really blessed me. I, it just really did something to me. That it just helped me understand prayer in a whole nother light. My, my, my daughter, she, <laughs> she, she has this desire for a pet. And, and, and originally we said, we'll get him a pet when, when DJ gets 12. And then we were like, eh, maybe we need to bump it up to 13. Because then the pet will become our responsibility and not theirs. So my daughter, whenever she wants something, she starts writing letters. You know, these long letters. They're, they're letters of affection, affirmation, how great you are. A little bit of manipulation. Uh, but, but they're all written so well. And, and, and she told my wife she wanted a bunny because she couldn't get a dog. And uh, my wife's like, I don't know about a bunny. But when you, like, I don't know about a bunny. So, so she comes to me and she says, I want a bunny. I said, oh, what your mama thought about the bunny? She said, Mom, I don't want a bunny. I said, I don't want a bunny either. She said, no, 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 Dad, but I really want a bunny. I said, and she created a carved animal out of cotton and made it a bunny. And she brought it to us and said, this is my new bunny that's fake, but it's my bunny. I was like, oh, man, look, at that's awesome. And then she comes back one day. She comes this, after school. She comes fired up. She has a drawing of a bunny that she did in class and everything. She comes to Dad, and she says, Dad, I got this letter. I want you to read it before you go to bed. And I already knew what it was about. It's that doggone bunny again. And she said, I want, I just, I, Dad, I want a bunny. And she said, I, I really want a bunny. And I said, Destiny, we're not going to get you a bunny. So she goes downstairs and she's on the patio and I see my wife and I guess my wife thought I punched her or something. She's like, you poke her heart. She's down there bawling. I was like, I didn't tell her anything. I just said she could have a bunny. So I go right there, and she's just. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Destiny, you, you, what's wrong? I, I just want a bunny. You guys won't give me a bunny. So I said, OK, OK. OK, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the bunny store. She said, okay, we're going to go to the bunny store. We got to go to this bunny store because the other store doesn't have bunnies, but this one has bunnies. It's 26 minutes away from the house. And we have to go to this one because this is the one that has the bunnies. So we go to the store yesterday, both girls, and I bring them to the bunny store. And we walk in, and there's the bunny. And oh, the bunny is so beautiful. And the lady's telling me about the bunny and all the things that bunnies can do and all you take care of bunnies and how you wash the bunnies and how they're not problematic bunnies. And my daughter's just bouncing around. She's excited. And the lady says, do you want to hold the bunny? She says, can I hold the bunny? Yes. She holds the bunny. She says, Daddy, the bunny's so soft. Ooh, the bunny, it's $70. I have $70. I said, but you don't have enough for the cage. Well, you could pay for the cage, and then I can get enough money and pay you back. I said, no, that's not how it works. And I said, no. She holds the bunny, and then little Desi, she's the cutest little thing. And I said, Desi, do you like the bunny? She says, oh, I love the bunny, Daddy. I love the bunny. And then all of a sudden, in the car, I told them that they got to sing this gospel song so that we can go in the store. And they sang it like a choir with all their heart. And, and I said, okay, good, because you sang it. We're going to actually go in the bunny store. Then we go in the bunny store. She holds the bunny, and then it's time to leave. And Daddy looks at her and says, even though it breaks my heart to tell you no, you still can't have the bunny. 
And some of you are looking like that and you're saying, oh, what a cruel dad called DCF. Some of you on YouTube looking for another pastor right now. You're Googling a church that's nearer, that's closer. But here's what I realized after talking to the lady. Even if I bought this bunny for this girl, the bunny would not be her responsibility. It would be my responsibility. And even though her tears move me to compassion, even though her tears move me to say, I want to do it. I had to make the best decision for a girl that doesn't understand what I see at 37 because she's 10 and the view that I have she doesn't have and that's the same thing your father says I want to do some great things for you I want to answer your request but the 37 year old God sees the 10 year old you and says this will become a heartbreaking experience because you don't know how to manage what you're asking for even though you want it, even though you desire it, even though your emotions are telling you that you should have it, but logic says you're not wise enough yet. You're not mature enough yet. And this bunny will become a problem in the house and it will start pooping in my house and it will start messing up my carpet and it will start messing up my floors and the bunny will just start escaping the house and all of the kids will be running rampant looking for a bunny. And I said, that's probably not the best decision even though it hurts your heart how many bunnies you've been asking God for how many tears have you been shedding trying to get God to change his mind and what daddy did because I knew it wasn't a good experience I said girls do y'all want some ice cream? They said yes. We took him to get some ice cream. It wasn't the bunny, but it was the father showing you. Even though I can't do this, I will do that. because they've been asking for ice cream for a long time and we just kept putting it off. They've been asking for twisty treats for a while and we put it off, but this gave us an opportunity to meet an answer that they've been requesting for a while that we remembered. Because God sometimes will let you leave the store in tears. It's sobering. When you hear your baby crying and you're like, I have the power to change it. But changing it won't help her. It'll enable her. And I know that's not the type of Christianity we want. We want to be able to worship and cry and then get God to say, how much is the bunny? I'm going to pay for the bunny. But then God would become a little G. I tell you, sometimes, even if God explained it to you, you still wouldn't get it. You know what's funny? How can we tell our kids, I said no, and that's what it means? But when God tells us no, it's not enough. I don't know why, but one thing I do know, it's my girls that ask for the bunny and ask us as parents for the bunny, we heard them. And at the right time, we'll answer what their heart's been asking for. And I pray today that you won't stop praying because you missed a few bunnies. But you'll trust God that his yes and his no are still working for your good. God bless you.